Our next speaker is Dr. Ethan Rudd, Senior Data Scientist at Sophos. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Dr. Ethan Rudd. Um, I'm a senior data scientist at Sophos, um, and the title of my talk is Loss is More, Improving Malware Detectors by Learning Additional Tasks. So um, before I go into the meat of the talk, I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about who I am so that you know that I'm not just some random guy that sort of stumbled in here off the street. Uh, this is my first time at DEF CON. Uh, very excited to be giving a first DEF CON talk. Um, and uh, thank you. I've been um, on the Sophos data science team um, for about two and a half years in a research capacity. Uh, prior to that, I worked on um, several projects and in several areas of applied machine learning. Um, my PhD research was funded by the IARPA Janus project. Um, uh, face recognition project. Um, I did a project at Google uh, with their advanced technologies and projects team. Um, and then I've been involved in several other small business and university projects. Um, so I mentioned the face recognition stuff because uh, we're also running a great facial recognition demo at the Unwind session. So please check that out. And uh, you can check me out on uh, Twitter or Google Scholar for, um, for various research if you like this talk. So what is this talk about? Well, um, as we've seen, there have been several great uh, talks on machine learning um, for information security prior to this one. Um, but um, for many machine learning malware detectors, we're looking at training on a, sim on a single malicious or benign label when there's actually lots of additional information available, lots of additional labels, lots of additional metadata, et cetera. Um, and so really the question that we answer in this talk is, can we train and craft a bunch of auxiliary labels to train on um, rather than just having a single malicious or benign label? And uh, can we get better performance? Um, well, as it turns out, we can. Um, and interestingly enough, we also find that these performance gains can be attributed to a better informed classifier. And I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit later on. So in before and after photos, if you will, what we're talking about is... Um, adding additional loss functions during the optimization. Uh, so on the before side, you'll see that we have uh, only a single loss function. This is how many malicious and uh, benign detectors are, are trained. Uh, and they work pretty well. There are a lot of them that are commercially deployed. Uh, you can get good performance. But if you add a bunch of auxiliary loss functions on a bunch of labels, uh, hence the after loss part of this uh, before after thing, we get way, way better performance, as it turns out. Um, so before I dive into exactly how we formulate this, I'll just give a brief review of machine learning for malware detection. Um, so up until about 2015, um, most malware detectors were uh, largely signature driven. There were a few machine learning, but um, ML really took off around then. Um, now, actually, a lot of the detectors consist of hybrid ML and Signature. Um, they use Signature largely for blacklisting. Um, and one can really triage uh, detection as, uh, as this diagram here, um, where um, ML and Signature detectors actually both work on uh, static and dynamic features. Um, for ML, static is a little bit more common, and we focus largely on static detection in this talk. And the reason, by the way, that static features are more common uh, is that to, to get ML to work well, it requires lots and lots and lots of data. And uh, it's easier to collect a lot of static data. Um, so we find that we can actually do very, very well with that. Um, so a typical detection pipeline is built on some sort of a binary classifier, um, a deep neural network, or maybe a gradient boosted machine. Um, I'll discuss the deep neural network use case um, for this talk, um, and we're talking about training on millions to hundreds of millions of, of labeled malicious and benign samples. Um, and we're also talking about classifiers that are periodically re retrained to be able to reflect current threat landscapes. Um, these can be deployed in a lot of different contexts. They can be deployed uh, actually on endpoints. They can be deployed in the cloud. They can be uh, deployed in security operations centers. Uh, it really doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk. Um, 
Now, as far as labeling sources that a lot of vendors use, um, they rely on um, vendor aggregation services or, or threat intelligence feeds, which basically take uh, a bunch of vendors or different labeling sources throughout the industry and submit um, malicious and benign samples to those and say, okay, how do these label the samples? And then um, some sort of an aggregate label is, is generally derived. Um, often there's also a little bit of time lag um, between, um, the, uh, um, uh, between the time at which the um, samples are submitted to the, to the vendors. And um, the, 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 there's, there's a little bit of time lag that's left to basically let vendors um, update their blacklists and let the scores settle down. But, um, uh, but long story short, most, most um, approaches take an aggregate malicious or benign label that is obtained from these, um, from these threat intelligence feeds. Um, now, these, uh, the, these detection engines uh, also, because they use ML, they need to convert um, the, the malicious and benign samples to some sort of, a friend, uh, to some sort of an ML-friendly numerical representation. Um, there are a variety of ways to do this. Um, some try and do something that's closer to raw bytes. Some use, uh, this, some use various types of uh, feature vector representations. We presume a specific one and we use uh, portable executable malware and benignware um, in, in this work. Um, but the approach can be, um, the, the, the approach is fairly broad and can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, so the way that a typical neural network will look is you'll have um, features that are extracted from malicious and benign samples um, during training. A forward pass is done through the network. Um, the output of the, uh, of the classifier is taken, and then some loss function along with the associated label is used to correct the representation so that we have a good representation that we can then later deploy. Um, at deployment time, we take this learned representation, and here we, I, I just want to highlight we don't have any labels on the, on the malware samples. That's what our classifier serves to do. We deploy that to wherever we're deploying, whether we're deploying on endpoints, whether we're deploying on socks, uh, whether we're deploying the cloud. And then we submit our, uh, our feature vectorized forms of our files uh, in real time to, um, to, to the uh, classifier. And in this case, our classifier is a neural network. It could be whatever, but we're dealing with neural nets in this work. Um, and uh, we use the predicted output basically as a score um, that says, okay, how malicious is this file? Um, a maliciousness score, if you will, that one can threshold in a variety of ways. So um, this is how things are currently done, uh, or, or commonly done, I should say. Um, however, just a little bit more on these threat intelligence feeds, they have lots and lots more information than just whether a given file is, uh, is malicious or benign. In fact, that's even a simplification from what they're providing. Um, they also provide information on individual vendor detections. They provide, of course, the net number of vendor detections. And then they provide some string information on uh, the detection names per vendor, at the very least. Some provide a lot more. So really revisiting the original question that I posed, can we craft and learn from auxiliary labels and get a better detector? Um, and the answer is yes, in fact, we can. Um, the technique that we've derived to do this, uh, we refer to as ALOHA, or Auxiliary Loss Optimization for Hypothesis Augmentation, um, hence the nice uh, Hawaiian art here uh, on the side. Um, so in short, um, we've got all this auxiliary information that we want to utilize, and as we saw in the case of just a malicious and benign label, well, we have this loss function um, that, that we use here. So why not just add more loss functions? Um, and that is, uh, that, that is really the crux of what Aloha does. Um, we have more labels, more loss functions. And uh, this has a couple of nice advantages. Um, first, we can, although we have more labels and we, we use more network outputs during training, um, we do not actually have to use these during deployment time. So we can notionally get a, much better network representation during training, but at deployment, um, we don't have to update our infrastructure at all. Um, now, alternatively, we can use the additional auxiliary outputs to do 
certain additional tasks. So if we want to do things that are, um, oh, say specific to like an EDR or an MDR type application where we're getting more fine-grained information about the particular malicious samples, uh, say maybe in a SOC, but maybe not on our endpoints, we can sort of dual purpose this training um, and use the learned models in a variety of ways. So for our labeling sources in this work, um, we selected nine vendors from our aggregation feed and uh, used detection labels from each of the respective vendors. Um, we also used the net number of vendor detections and there were more than nine in our feed. There were, there were tens um, and used the integer value of the number of vendor detections as an auxiliary target as well. Um, we also use our main target of, uh, of this aggregate malicious and benign label. Um, and then uh, we also use 11 semantic uh, malware attribute tags. So these describe the content of, um, of malicious and benign samples. These are derived from, um, from the detection names within our feed. Um, the derivation process I can speak a little bit more to at the end, um, but I would actually refer you guys to a, uh, in my opinion, very good paper that we wrote on it. Um, and I'll, I'll include the link for that in the end. But basically these tags are, are, not, um, are, are not mutually exclusive and they summarize the content of um, malicious benign samples in ways that a human can understand. So for each of these additional labels and network outputs, we have additional loss functions. Um, and so our main aggregate loss function is actually a binary cross entropy loss um, taken for, between the output of the, um, the the output of the network and the aggregate malicious and benign tag um, or, or aggregate malicious and benign label. Um, now this is th this is a pretty common loss function for a lot of neural networks that are doing um, malware classification. But with respect to our auxiliary losses, we have um, a loss function that is specific to the vendors, one for the tags. Uh, the semantic tags, um, and then one for the counts. Um, and for the vendor loss functions, we actually take a sum of binary cross entropy losses for each individual vendor response. Um, for the tag losses, we take uh, we, we do a very analogous thing, but for each of the attribute tags. Now, I would I would again point out that none of these tags are mutually exclusive, um, so we use binary cross entropy here rather than. Uh, or, or rather than say a um, softmax categorical cross entropy um, and, and take the sum. Um, then for the count loss function, um, we use a uh, Poisson um, loss on this. Um, now, uh, prior to that, we, we do an exponential activation to constrain our count range from zero to, um, uh, well, basically to be non-negative as counts can't be non-negative. So our total loss is, is written um, at the bottom here. And uh, this consists of the malicious and benign loss um, with all of our auxiliary losses just summed and multiplied by a constant. Now, the constant in this case, um, we used 0 0.1. Um, we didn't explore good values of this in depth, but other work has. And so we did this uh, sort of in a, in a principled manner consistent with, uh, with some other work that I'll reference towards the end here. So during training, and you, you've seen this at the beginning of the talk, but basically we have all these aggregate loss functions um, where we have a main malicious and benign loss that's what we're trying to ultimately optimize for and detect. But with respect to the aggregate loss functions, we have our, uh, our vendor counts, our, indivi uh, our individual vendor detections, and our attribute tags. Um, now, um, the... Uh, uh, aggregating all of these losses together, um, we can use all of these or just one or two of these auxiliary losses, um, or we could even potentially add more if we had more information in our feed. I would very much point out that this is, uh, you know, this is sort of a proof of concept model, a, um, a, a very uh, general sort of architecture that I'm describing. Um, but uh, the point is that adding these auxiliary losses uh, theoretically helps um, at inference time, however, um, absolutely nothing has to change whatsoever with respect to the network outputs. You'll see that in the prior slide, um, we had all of these different outputs that we added, but we, we pruned those, we pruned the associated model parameters uh, at inference time. 
And uh, so our deployment infrastructure can remain entirely the same. We don't have to change that at all, um, which is nice from an engineering perspective. So I've made these claims that uh, the, the Aloha model works very well. Um, now I intend to actually provide some evidence of that. Um, and uh, to do that, we collected a data set uh, of approximately 9 million training samples, um, 100,000 validation samples, and 7.7 .7 million test samples. And the training and validation split was taken temporarily before the test split to ensure um, basically a fair evaluation. I mean, we can't fit, um, in order to ensure temporal consistency, um, we, uh, we, we ordered our, our uh, samples as follows. Um, and uh, for our aggregation, um, for our aggregate malicious benign label, we used what, what we call a one minus five plus criterion here, um, which basically means that for one or fewer vendor detections, we, we label as benign, and for five or more, we label as uh, malicious, and then we ignore those with, uh, with two to four labels. Um, now, I'd mentioned there are, there are more sophisticated ways to do this. This is just the one we chose largely for, um, for simplicity, but there are, there are more, more sophisticated ways to do this. But this, uh, th this works pretty well. It's a, it's a fairly standard practice. Um, when we look at actually the vendor counts across our data set, and looking at this was one of the reasons why we chose the one minus five plus. But what you'll see is that there are uh, a disproportionate number of, uh, of one minus and specifically zero, and then a lot that have um, many, many, many vendor counts. Um, and bear in mind, these are taken over a, over a logarithmic scale. Um, however, we still see, and this was one of our motivations for using account loss initially, that, um, that, that just taking this, this, these basic thresholds washes out a lot of finer grained information. So this was actually one of our motivations for the count loss. Um, and uh, as, as you can see, it's not, a, it's not really a common occurrence, but we might be able to say something about uh, relative sample difficulty by adding that. Um, we also looked at the uh, respective vendor agreements with one another, and, and these are plotted in this confusion matrix here um, for each of our nine selected uh, so-called high coverage vendors. And as we can see, we can uh, we see an agreement that occurs most of the time, but um, not all the time. I mean, vendors are consistent, uh, oh, approximately eighty-five to to ninety-five percent of the time, but they don't always agree. So perhaps there's some independent auxiliary information that we can glean from these. Um, as features, uh, we use the same features as uh, as Saxon Berlin did um, in their work. Uh, deep neural network-based malware detection using two-dimensional binary program features. Um, in full disclosure, um, uh, SAX is my, my boss, uh, so that's one of the reasons why, uh, why we chose to use these features. We used uh, the features that, uh, that he and others within our, uh, within our group derived. Um, and I won't go into these in depth, but I leave the paper there, and I, I just want to give sort of a semblance of, of what, what these are. Um, so um, basically, they, they fall into... Um, uh, three different camps. Um, so uh, 512 of the dimensions of our net 1024 dimensional feature vector are based on uh, windowed uh, byte statistics and basically aggregate histograms of, uh, sorry, um, windowed byte statistic uh, histograms, um, which are basically aggregate statistics over the entire file. Um, we then have 256 dimensions uh, devoted to a um, two-dimensional string length uh, hash histogram, or basically across a, a logarithmic scale of different lengths, um, we apply the hashing trick. Um, and then we, um, we, we also have specific um, P metadata fields, uh, like the exports, like the imports, et cetera, that are hashed into another 256-dimensional vector. And all of these get concatenated, so that's our, that's our representation of, uh, of, indi of individual files. So that's how our data set breaks down. Um, when we compare performance here, um, so we tried using different combinations of our main malicious and benign loss with, with different auxiliary losses. So uh, we used one, just our malicious and benign loss um, as our baseline, uh, so that's that's sort of tantamount to a lot of types of models that are currently deployed. 
Um, then we applied each individual loss type. Then we applied everything um, combined, which I guess you might say is the full Aloha model. Um, and we uh, fit each of these classifiers uh, for each different loss combination. Actually, we fit five different classifiers, and we report our, um, our, our results in terms of um, mean and variance statistics um, over, uh, over receiver operating characteristics curves to be able to gauge uh, statistical significance. Um, now, for those, I, I know that there's a lot of talent um, in the room with, uh, with uh, a lot of different backgrounds. So um, for those of you that might need a refresher on receiver operati operating characteristics curves or ROC curves, basically we look at this false positive rate across the um, x-axis and then a true positive rate or a detection rate at that false positive rate across the y-axis. And so uh, typically what's done in the industry is um, at various false positive rates that are, that are deemed sort of acceptable to the user, um, a, a threshold is chosen and then you'll get the true positive rate at that uh, threshold. So what we see when we add our, um, our count loss is that we do in fact get better uh, performance in terms of both the area under the receiver operating characteristics curve which is basically a gauge of how good is the curve overall. But specifically, we see also at, uh, at higher false positive rate regions, um, or uh, sorry, lower, lower false positive rate re regions, um, we see a particular bump. And uh, this becomes uh, a bump in detection rate. Now, this becomes relevant because as we get to lower and lower FPR regions, um, there are more deployment scenarios that we can address with our models. Um, similarly, for the vendor loss, when we add that to our uh, to, when we add that to our baseline, um, we see a, a boost in the um, receiver operating characteristics curve or ROC curve at the relevant region. Um, we don't see quite as much of a boost in terms of um, the area under the curve. In fact, the the area under the curve stays uh, statistically pretty similar. Um, and uh, that's not to say that this isn't still a very significant result. Um, in fact, uh, again, the, the, the AUC is a net um, statistic on the, uh, on the curve, but we don't really care so much about the higher false positive rate um, regions uh, because the detection rates there are very, very good already. And so we can deploy those um, very easily. Um, but a, a, as we're getting down, you know, we see that Although the, the AUC is relatively similar, we still see this as, uh, as basically a win. Um, the tags loss gives us a similar result. Um, and I'd mentioned that actually both of these, uh, both of these loss functions, the tags and the, um, and the vendor's loss functions, um, not only do they assume sort of a similar functional form, um, but they also give us an even better result than the, um, than the Poisson loss function did or the count loss at the lower false positive rate areas, um, but they are slightly worse in terms of, uh, in, in terms of AUC performance. When we combine everything together, what we find is that we get even better results. And we find that not only are our results um, far better, but our variance between different model instantiations is reduced. Um, and we see basically there are two modes of improvement here. There's an improvement at the higher false positive rates that is above 10 to the negative third. And then there's an improvement um, below that. Um, and basically the, the higher FPR improvements, um, th these are really what are driving the, the area under the curve improvements. Um, but again, the lower FPR ones are, um, are still quite relevant. So in summary, um, we see that yes, adding additional losses does seem to improve performance, and uh, notice, notably, it also reduces uh, variance across different instantiations of the model. Um, we suspect that this is actually occurring. Uh, th this variance reduction is occurring because as you have more things to optimize for, you're inherently sort of constraining your optimization process. Uh, so there, there aren't as many different types of ways that parameters can vary. Um, we also see that uh, there are similar behavior for similar loss types. So both of the vendor losses and tag losses it consists of sums of, of binary cross entropy losses. Um, and again, these seem to 
drive different things with respect to our, our ROC curve. Um, we suspect that we see these higher F, uh, these higher FPR gains in detection um, for the uh, for the count loss because it actually does communicate something about the difficulty of samples. Um, and then with respect to the tag losses, um, perhaps the network's able to correlate some sort of information um, between when, say, just one or two of these vendor tags trigger versus when, say, all of them trigger. Um, and so it, so it drives things really at lower, lower um, FPRs. So, okay, we've presented, or I've, I've presented some evidence, hopefully, that the Aloha model is um, able to deliver better detection performance. But now I, I'll just really briefly uh, discuss what's driving this performance gain. Um, is it some sort of a smoother optimization service that's brought about due to, due to a regularization effect of multi-objective optimization? Um, or is it perhaps um, due to a more informed representation from, uh, from all of these different auxiliary label sources? And, uh, you know, going into this, we sort of suspect the, the latter of these two, um, but, you know, we want to actually make sure um, and, and see what's going on here. So in order to test this, we used auxiliary loss functions on, on so-called non-informative targets. So we, we employed various mechanisms of duplicating labels. Um, one of the ways that we did this was, uh, or, or, or using, um, or, or providing labels that delivered no, no additional information about the sample. Um, one way that we did this was with a pseudo-random label where we took the hash of the file contents and just took the sign of that as an auxiliary target. So uh, for a given file, you're going to be looking at the same label, but the labels are just pretty much randomly, uh, randomly there. Um, we also tried adding a duplicate target um, and optimizing for that. And then we also applied a um, duplicate target with a different type of loss function. So we scaled and shifted a copy of the target label and then we uh, used a mean squared error loss on this, which is a, a common regression loss. And so from these, what did we find? Well, we found that adding these non-informative losses uh, did not improve our performance in a, in a noticeable manner at all. In fact, uh, it was statistically identi uh, identical, uh, if not worse, um, when we added auxiliary, uh, auxiliary targets that um, to, to our original target as well. Um, so this suggests that yes, the Aloha network gains are actually coming from additional information from the additional labels. The network's doing what we want it to do and it is learning um, a better representation, a better informed representation. So overall what we find is that yes, um, our Aloha technique works well um, and uh, it seems to be a result of the neural network's ability to actually correlate information from auxiliary labeling sources. Um, it's not just simply an artifact of regularization. Um, we also have the advantage that the network can be trained and deployed with minimal changes to uh, existing infrastructure that's out there. So no re-engineering of, um, of anything on the endpoint, anything on the SOC, anything in the cloud has to take effect. Um, and then also there are additional applications that these... Uh, that these outputs can be used for, um, like EDR and MDR. So one additional ap application, as an example, is uh, since we have outputs that describe the content of the malware, we can actually group malware by the predicted tags. Um, and, you know, we might have an application where um, we might want to deploy that sort of for internal use or, 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 say, as a service, but yet still be able to deploy our model. Well, we can do that all under this one training regime just by pruning our losses um, uh, and pruning our uh, pruning our outputs, respectively. Um, so, before I take some Q and A here, I just wanted to also mention some related research um, and some directions for future work. If you if you found this topic uh, interesting, um, there's been a lot of research by our group and also by other groups um, that is related. It's interesting to look into, and it can perhaps be leveraged in some very similar ways. Um, so first, I'd also mention that uh, Aloha is a, is a Usenix paper now, so uh, I'll be presenting this at Usenix next week. Um, but uh, interestingly, come, oh yeah, and it's available on archive as well, so, uh, so feel free to check it out if you want more, more information. Um, 
interestingly, um, a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jason Trost um, actually did a nice blog post where he where he uh, used Aloha architectures for a um, for, for a much different problem um, using uh, using end gamings um, domain generation algorithm um, a detection code. Uh, he 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 tailored that to to use um, to, to use basically these Aloha losses. And uh, anyway, he he did a nice blog post about his results. Um, there's also a paper out of Microsoft Research called MTNet, um, and uh, this paper actually is, is similar to ours in a variety of ways. Um, it uses an impressively large data set of dynamic features, and it largely substantiates um, a lot of our findings. Um, however, uh, they use only one type of loss function. Uh, they use multiple loss functions, but only a categorical cross-entropy softmax. Um, they do something sort of similar to a... Um, to, to, to a um, tagging approach that we do, d describing the content of each sample, except they use uh, Microsoft um, malware family names. And so they actually do employ some sort of a mutual exclusivity assumption here. Um, but uh, anyway, it's another great paper, and uh, it's very cool to see that they're also able to sort of substantiate our findings with a, with a much different data modality. It's also PE files, but it is dynamic features. Um, I'll also mention the uh, paper on malware attribute tagging. So uh, smart semantic malware attribute relevance tagging um, is a paper that we also put out there, which will uh, pretty much tell you everything about everything that you want to know about malware tagging. Um, it is uh, the approach, the, the, the tagging approach is the, the same as we employ in this, uh, in, in this work. Um, so please see that for, uh, for details on the tagging problem and the tag prediction problem. Um, there are several other models that we um, employ in the, in, in the SMART paper as well. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that, check it out. Um, I will also mention um, another paper that uh, Moon, a mixed objective optimization network. The reason why I bring this up is while this is applied to facial attributes, it has nothing to do with malware. Um, it is actually the approach that I use in my face recognition demo which uh, again, please please uh, stop by during the wind down session if you want to see basically how this type of optimization can be employed very powerfully in action. Um, the approach is fundamentally the same as as Aloha, but with a much much different data modality. Um, one final work that I'll mention, then I promise I'm done, <laughs> is uh, a work uh, paper that we did called Learning from Context. Um, it uses um, multi-view learning or multi-input learning um, in contrast to our, our approach using multiple labels and multiple loss functions. But using this approach, we are able to um, include extra information in the representation um, just in, in a different way. We're sort of turning the Aloha approach on its, an, on its head. And um, this type of approach could be trivially combined with Aloha, I would mention. Um, so that's that's maybe a nice direction for future work. So having multiple um, multiple P file features and then also other auxiliary information, like we took the we took embeddings of the path on of the P file on disk and um, and concatenated those together, um, but also potentially multiple labels. Um, you know that uh, just adding a adding multiple information uh, multiple other sources of information into the representation. It seems to work well, um, so it's it's definitely an avenue for um, for future research. Um, I'll finally close with an obligatory Sophos pitch. So um, I'm with the Sophos data science team. Um, we do really cutting edge research, and we're always interested in transparency and collaboration, uh, and in uh, hopefully <laughs> I've communicated publication. Um, and while we're not the only one, we are one of the only research teams in the MLSEC industry that is getting. Um, Papers accepted at uh, some of the top tier academic venues like Usenix. Uh, our group consists of about 10 to 15 people. We're split about half between research, about half in development. Um, and so, uh, check out uh, check out our group if you're if you're interested. Uh, uh, you can talk with me, or you can talk with uh, Rich Harang, who's uh, who's also here, who's one of our directors of data science. Um, here's a picture of our team. Lots of great, colorful characters. Um, there's uh, some more Sophos. Uh, Presentations going on this week. Uh, as I said, I have a, a facial recognition booth. Um, 
Rich has a talk on uh, hacking facial recognition on the on the 10th. Um, and then he also presented a talk on um, uh, on security data science at B-Sides. So if any of you saw that, there's just a name to correlate. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'd like to thank Sophos for funding and for promoting this research. Um, and I'd particularly like to thank my collaborators and my co-authors here um, for all the work that they did. This was uh, definitely a team effort. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so that, that's a great question. The question is, so uh, this talk was about incorporating these auxiliary losses on neural networks, but have we tried other classifiers like ensemble models, uh, random forest boosting, et cetera? And um, while I would say that we don't have, uh, while we don't have concrete results here uh, on those, um, there is nothing that would, uh, I, there's nothing that would preclude a person from doing so. Um, the representation, uh, that's learned by an ensemble model is is a little bit different. Um, so I guess that like in the in, in say a random forest uh, or, or in, a, in a boosted model, uh, I guess the question is how you would do shared splits in a way that works well across data. So I'd say that the technique could be very well applied. Um, I don't know how well it would work. Uh, I can say that I've looked at um, some of the libraries that are out there for this. Um, like LightGBM, like XGBoost, et cetera. And uh, they generally assume that you're gonna be using only one loss function, but um, there's nothing that would preclude somebody from implementing it. I just don't know how well it would work. Thank you. Um, let's see, more questions? Yes, please. Um, so what are some of the, uh, the next steps of the process? Um, so. And, and some of the features that we want to develop. So, so features in terms of representation of the, uh, sorry, in terms of representations of the malware fed to the classifier or features in terms of just like extra things to tack onto the classifier? Sure, sure, yeah, so, so extra um, additions to this overall technique. So, um, you know, I would certainly say that w the approach that I'm most interested in is actually having a unified um, multi-input and multi-output model that's really able to um, learn multiple labels or, or learn from multiple labels, but also um, also have multiple just heterogeneous inputs. Like, um, you know, you could have, uh, you could have as an example, the, um, the character embeddings of the file path. You know, you could, uh, you could also apply this, I would say, to a lot of different malware types. Um, you know, I've uh, I, I've been talking about P files this entire time, but there are a lot of different types of malware that one could apply this to. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd say that those are two different avenues that um, that you know I'd certainly like to go down. Um, and then I'd, I'd also say that there are other um, sources of of data that are on some of these um, threat feeds, and so I think that looking into those would be uh, would be very interesting as well. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so, well, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'd say that not only does it not do uh, worse, I mean, it does, it, it, on a, in aggregate, it does better. Um, and I would say that, yeah, if you have multiple inputs, um, Yes, uh, we do see, in fact, and, and we have seen, that, I'd actually point you to that um, learning from context paper, that, um, yeah, we do, get a, we do get a nice performance bump, but actually, yes, having, um, having missing data is um, a little bit more of a problem with that. Um, so for, uh, for our loss functions here, if we have a missing label, um, we can just zero that entry out in the loss. But if we have a missing, um, and just backpropagate that, but if we have a missing input, well, that, that becomes a lot more um, a lot more hairy, and you know that that's an area of research that I'd really like to see addressed uh, a little bit better. 
Um, let's see, I think we have t uh, uh, time for one more. One more question. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So the the question is which inputs are are, are most um, are, are most prominent in terms of the the respective output response. And so so this goes back to a lot of the model interpretability literature. Um, so you know I'd say the uh, Lime Shap values uh, uh, layer wise irrelevance propagation. Uh, you know uh, a lot of the literature in that area would be uh, would be very good to look at, and, or, uh, or or techniques like uh, activation maximization. Um, but uh, yeah, those those are a few techniques, and it's definitely an area where I think that not only I I, I think that not to speak for the entire industry, but I think that they're interested in that. So uh, anyway, uh, I can chat more after on that. But uh, yeah, thank you, uh, th thank you for um, the question. Good question. Thank you.